Hello and welcome to another edition of my lecture series on cinema and the American avant-garde. If you're getting something out of these videos, please do support using one of the links listed below in the description. So in this one, I'm going to be looking at Stan Brakhage and thinking about romanticism. This lecture mainly focuses on Brakhage as a romanticist, but please do bear in mind that there are many other ways to approach looking at his film career. He was born on the 14th of January in 1933 in Kansas City, Missouri in the USA as Robert Sanders. He was adopted at three weeks by Ludwig and Clara Brackage and he was renamed James Stanley. He died on the 9th of March 2003 in Victoria, British Columbia in Canada. Brackage's formative years weren't really all that different from Maya Darren's who we looked at in the previous video. He too edged into filmmaking from a background in poetry and his earliest works beginning in 1952 at the age of 19 can easily be compared to those of Darren and their contemporaries so people like Kenneth Anger who we're going to get to later. A difference was that his early work didn't show the same degree of influence from pre-war Europe like the others. He also didn't finish his education. Instead, he dropped out of college to make films. In 1954, he moved to New York from San Francisco and there met the Greenwich Village crowd. So people like Mary Menken, Jonas Mekas, Willard Mass, John Cage and Maya Darren. And he even stayed with Darren briefly. He moved to Denver and struggled as a budding filmmaker and had to take work making industrial shorts to survive. He met his first wife Jane there, whom he married in 1957. If you've ever seen a film called Window Water Baby Moving, which I have to point out, I watched it as an undergrad and I am still traumatised by it. That features Jane giving birth to their first of five children. Brackage taught film history and aesthetics for a while in University of Colorado in Boulder in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Apparently he was integral to building their programme. He separated from Jane in 1986 and married Marilyn Brackage in 1989 with whom he had two more children and she now, at the time of preparing this in 2013 at least, was still looking after his estate. Like Maya Darren, Brackage wrote prolifically on film. He was a theorist as well as a filmmaker and he made more than 300 films in his life of many different durations. You can pause and note down some of those publications if you want to look into that a bit further. Looking at Brackage's methods and techniques, he worked mainly in 8mm. His films involve very short shot durations, so it feels like the editing's moving very fast. He uses a lot of superimposition, so he's constantly putting images on top of one another, and you have abstraction mixed with live action. He played around with what the camera was capable of quite a lot, so he uses different focal ranges and exposures. There's a lot of handheld camera work in his films. He sometimes used paint as well. He would do different things with paint on the lenses or paint on whatever he was filming. And his films tend to be non-narrative. They're not so much anti-narrative, but they're non-narrative. So they're not really telling you a story, but there are actions that connect up in them. And he tended to make work in cycles. So he would make epic films and he would make them in parts. Dog Star Man was spanning 1961 to 1964. So he would make one part and then he would progress and make other parts and they would all speak to each other. So others include Art of Vision, Songs, Scenes from Under Childhood, Sexual Meditations, Pittsburgh Trilogy, Faust film. Now we're in this lecture looking mainly at the beginning of his career proper as an avant-garde filmmaker, so mainly the epic that spans several years, Dog Star Man. And notably it was recognition from Jonas Mekas, the same critic who derided Darren. 
that largely affected a change in reception to Brackage's films. And so when Mechas took notice of him, other people took notice of him and that leads towards him becoming canonised and this is an underpinning concern of this module, if you like, this set of lectures, is how do we reach a canon of these things and how do we disrupt and dismantle that so really it was one man pulling up another that we can start to see the beginning of such a canon. These cycles of films, so these shorter films that are brought together in parts, for example with Dog Starman, it's a film in four parts but it has a very long prelude section so it's really five short films all brought into one. The main themes of his work were birth, life, sex and death. Brackage also made documentary film. In the 1960s, he moved away from psychodrama, so he had been making work more like Darren's before that other people would have called or labelled as psychodrama. And you'll see more of an exploration of psychodrama when we come to look at anger. Brackage liked to have the freedom to let his camera roam around and appear uncontrolled as if the camera had its own autonomy and was able to reflexively expose acts of filmmaking so just make it obvious I'm a film being made now including exposing the film leader if you ever get to see the Flux films you'll see this the film leader is the parts at the end of a film reel that are blank so it's literally the what leads it into the spool if you know what I mean and he uses that rather than the part with the actual film on it and so he would expose that and use that in the film he would over or under expose the film so that it was clear that you were looking at a photographic image he would blur the focus and include sudden flares so all the sorts of things which feel very commonplace in mainstream now because of people like JJ Abrams employing it a lot but these are things that were a complete no-no in fiction filmmaking at the time you you're supposed to hide all of that stuff because sun flaring makes it clear again that you're looking through the lens of a camera. He dispensed with staged pro-filmic events so the pro-filmic is what gets set up before you start filming so if you were making fiction it would be dressing the set getting the actors in place getting the blocking sorted out getting the cameras positioned and that sort of stuff so he just stopped doing all of that he would just decide on the day what he was going to film so there was no drama in a theatrical sense and even when his his family were involved in the films they appear as really just a series of banal occurrences or flashed images I suppose almost like the way memories would flash up and you might get a bit like a still or a very slight moving image in your mind when you remember something. A slightly dramatic element of Dog Star Man could be Brackage as a nondescript man trying and repeatedly failing to climb a snowy mountainside with a dog. There is no sense that this figure is in any way a protagonist. Instead that role goes to Brackage as the filmmaker. The filmmaker is the protagonist in this. Similar to Darren, Brackage became somewhat of an artistic persona and according to Bruce Elder Brackage saw this persona as an extension and product of his family and when we see family dramas in Brackage's films as we do in The Stars Are Beautiful they are real they are being themselves and they're very real people and often they, these were just events that he happened to film and it was pretty much everything I suppose this is a precursor to how many people who own camera phones today in the 21st century just film everything all the time they're in the habit of doing that he is somebody who was filming constantly and in a way they were home movies but I suppose being seen with a cinematic eye and then this real is a huge raft of questions about intrusiveness, invasiveness, privacy, consent. There are ethical questions over how he made his work and how they involved his family 
and um, his children and um, his wife in very intimate circumstances. Sometimes when Brackage is taught, it would be through, say, looking at him as an experimental documentarian and describing those sorts of films as documentary. And I suppose in a way that blurs the boundary between documentary and home video, in a sense. You know, documentary sounds very professional, whereas home video sounds amateur. But really, (laughs) I think you should see the films for yourself and judge for yourself and see what you think. I wanted to come in here to try try and draw a rough chronology of experimental film in North America by looking at certainly looking at scholarship that essentially identifies where Brackage picks up from and improves on Maya Darren's intentions and wishes for her idea of a New York cinema. And looking back to Darren, she talks about how ineffective standard and traditional documentary is in dealing with its subject matter, largely because of its predilection for realist photography. Which points out that Darren asserts that, quote, the unique privilege of film lies precisely in its ability to present a series of images which depicts an argument and interplay between the imaginative and the real, and that the contradictory nature of cinema should be wholly embraced, unquote, page 117. And while if you watch Brackage's work, it will probably not be documentary as you conceive it to be. Darren's writing on documentary and how it should embrace cinema's inherent contradictions help us to contextualise Brackage's personal different kind of documentary style. This is a style with concerns over what is happening internally, what is happening emotionally, what is happening in the imagination, what is happening in your consciousness. Where Darren places the onus on the camera as the artist and champion the abilities of the technology to capture images as they occurred, Brackage began to move away from links with realism to create a lyrical, more romantic form. And before long, his actions placed him in opposition with Darren, who had once promoted his early work. And drawing out Pruitch's observations, perhaps Darren is a cinema of the outside, the external, looking in. The photographic realism plays what is filmed and any distortion or unreality occur in the editing, typically in her films. And the editing we can consider as the space between real images, images as they were filmed. For Brackage though, optical tricks made possible by the technology convey internal realities, perhaps of the imagination and unconscious. So we might think of his as a cinema of the inside and a lot of his films were about trying to see from the inside out. So we can ask is there a tension here between modernism and classicism? The external nature of Darren's filmmaking complements her anti-Freud stance while Brackage goes on voyages of discovery but internal ones. His films externalise the interior self. They see how he sees from the inside. Interestingly, while Darren did initially support and promote Brackage's earlier work, her anagram situates his films in the medium of painting, specifically the early modernist realm of abstract expressionism. Because one of Brackage's concerns was trying to obtain closed eye vision or internal sight. And he did make hand-painted films later on as he moved further towards abstraction. Elder points out that Brackage's philosophy is similar to the abstract expressionists in that they appear, quote, at one with nature, unquote, and Brackage's films are infused with it and on a different plane of consciousness. In such later work, it emerged that Brackage felt reality was empty. He was feeling the isolation and fear of freedom that drove early modernist artists to abstraction. So think then about Miller's ideas about Brackage as a romantic occasionalist. Brackage's aesthetics are linked with time, tradition and history. Moments and instants can be the temporal vessel of an occasion, but not necessarily linked. So are they like real life or any experience from real life? 
his techniques for the occasional break free of traditional film language. Memory for Brackage is, quote, an aesthetic shackle, unquote. His films take place in the moment. They have a state of presentness. Miller states that Brackage's, quote, occasionalist vision shatters time, unquote, which you might experience if you sit and view the work. This omission of memory is significant though because the forgetting in his films, the moving on quickly, says something about the modern condition of humanity, particularly in the latter half of the 20th century. As life moved on from wars and the impact of television changed communications and visual culture on a massive scale. I can't help reflecting on this after having quite a lot of time now even since doing this module in 2013, this time eight years ago from making these videos. How much that has intensified in the 21st century with social media and having smartphones that connect us so quickly with the rest of the world and give us too much information to have to process in very short amounts of time. It's very difficult to be present. So we're in a state of presentness at all times and our memories are affected. But at the same time, we have not dealt with the traumas of the previous century. We have not dealt with the traumas from our earlier lives. The pacification that television gave in the 20th century, it feels just massively multiplied these days, while at the same time causing much more trauma. So there's probably something to tease out there that would be clearer on that. Now, while considering the passage of time, we might recall the previous video's discussions of Darren's use of space in conjunction with this. Annette Mickelson states that, quote, rather than splice a moment of time into which she could insert the integrality of a film, she attempted to work with the single moment, distending it into a filmic structure of exquisite ambiguity underwritten by the braver spatial strategies that came perhaps more easily to the developed kinetic sense of one who had been trained as a dancer. It was left for Stan Brackage to radicalise this revision of filmic temporality in posting the sense of a continuous present of a filmic time which devours memory and expectation in the presentation of presentness. To do this one had of course to destroy the spatio-temporal coordinates in terms of which past and present events define themselves as taking place in time." Unquote. Rather than action in a true sense, we have a meshing of different images with different exposures, colours and pacing. Slow motion shots are mixed with those filmed with anamorphic lenses, extreme close-ups and shaky uncontrolled pans of the sky and landscape. There is no flow in space or time. Brackage's films have been called hypnagogic, which relates to the state we fall into immediately before falling asleep. The films effectively convey those incoherent moments as our minds race towards sleep. But what is actually seen in these? Is there a bearing witness at this point? In terms of mise-en-scene and specifically colour, Brackage was inspired by Rothko's darkness, purity and non-representational colour. We see body parts inside and out. We see a baby, one of the Brackage children. We see the mountainside, the endlessly climbing man and the dog. We see scratched and coloured film leader. We see psychedelic sun flares and traffic lights. There are times when we see all of these pretty much at the same time. By doing this, Brackage is, in a way, a visual poet, greatly knowledgeable about poetry and poets as well. Romanticism was a 19th century art, literary and intellectual movement and it reacted against the Enlightenment in Europe which rationalised nature with science. Romanticism wanted to focus on emotion, on the emotions drawn from aesthetic experience. And this was followed in the second half of the 19th century by realism, which was opposed to romanticism. And Brackage, somehow he seems to achieve something in between. He tends to combine both of these in the mid-20th century. 
Tyrus Miller points out that Brackage's work marks a withdrawal from increasing technological advancement in modernity and back towards the celebration of the past and nature. They are about individual experience as protest against the impersonal social forces, making us conform to sameness, preferring subjective, lyrical, intimate expressionism. It was boiling things back down to the personal from the mass, getting back to nature from industrialization, moving away from political thought to immediate emotional reactions. His images even convey what Preach calls, quote, a stream of interior ideas feelings and memories as they emerged, developed and perhaps dissolved only to give way to other ideas." Unquote. That's from page 122. Pooch admits that Brackage made subjective documentaries of his immediate surroundings. Brackage's later writings grapple with the existence of God through men, to put it simply, which might suggest a degree of pantheism in the films. And again, this thinks back to metaphysical and romantic poetry in the 19th century, where there was pantheistic work that was identifying God and nature and rocks and that sort of thing. Dog Star Man partially depicts a journey, a single man's struggle in and with nature. Many of Brackage's images might be suggestive of the void of religious experience. The same vastness complies with the modernist destruction of appearances, denial of the surface image, the physical world and the emergence of the spiritual. It is a reality tantamount to nothing. Perhaps he overwhelmed himself in the incomprehensible enormity of existence and the individual's insignificance within that. For Brackage, there is a tension between the image representing the content of consciousness and as a form embodying energies of the greater field of being, the hidden internal and the incomprehensible external. Elder argues that Brackage resolves this tension in Dog Star Man through self-identification with the quote, larger matrix, unquote. For example, if we look at the fast-paced montage between the mountain and pumping blood, we see a significant exterior structure, not simply juxtaposed but melded and clashing with something interior and beyond human vision. The microscopic images of cells and pulsing blood vessels appear again in part three in a similar form, and this time against what appear to be moments of sexual and natal intimacy with Jane, also incorporating coloured strips of film leader. Here, the meaning and form are directly related. There is a reliance on technology to obtain sight of what cannot be seen. Brackage utilises both the mechanism of the camera, photographic realism, and his own ability to place the camera's products in meaningful compositions relating to his key theme of life. And this is looking way off to Bill Viola, who we'll look at towards the end of this series, who was concerned with visualising the interconnectivity of all things. So what we're looking at here is fragmented nature, but parts that amount to to the whole. And so to think again then about the canon. On Senses of Cinema, Brian Fry begins his Great Director's article on Brackage by saying, quote, If Maya Darren invented the American avant-garde cinema, Stan Brackage realised its potential, unquote. Just to point out, this is the only way a woman gets to be part of the canon is if she made it in the first place. So anyway, moving on and um, returning to the legacy of Darren as a driving force behind our cinema production in the US may be the driving force. We might recall Bill Nichols when Pritch states that, quote, she cogently and persuasively mapped out for avant-garde practitioners in the post-war era a manner of filmmaking in which the representational means themselves could become the basis of a highly complex intellectual drama, unquote. That's in page 119. The idea of Barack as romantic and avant-garde is jarring because we see a reversal of modernist concerns and cultural politics. And this is why Miller describes Brackage's work as occasions for the viewer because they are not an instrument of personal aesthetic or political awakening for them. 
that's not his intention. They are about him. The post-war avant-garde naturally saw a movement away from broader socio-political messages because previous anxieties were just not as prominent anymore. There was an opportunity to explore the personal because you had a bit more time to think about it. Brackage offers a different way of seeing even to the rest of the avant-garde. And to help argue the case for Brackage in the canon, Miller draws on Weiss's discussion of Brackage from a Leotardian point of view. Leotard's Freudianism aside, Weiss manages to reaffirm Brackage's place in the avant-garde by arguing that the liberation from societal norms that the viewer experiences while watching such work in general is integral to quote avant-garde exemplarity unquote. So Miller states Quote, the sensuous intensivity of the work unleashes excessive and perverse libidinal charges in the spectator, which makes the experience of the avant-garde work a kind of training ground or laboratory of liberation from the wider field of social repressions and norms. Unquote. I probably wouldn't use a quotation like this anymore because I just find these broad strokes assumptions on behalf of an assumed spectator where everybody is lumped in together that this would happen to everybody watching this is a bit problematic but it's just where I am now. So although deeply personal it is perhaps this trait alone that makes Brackage somehow political okay that idea that the personal is the political that is the continued disruption of the norm by exposing the audience to a liberal alternative in form and content. Brackage paved the way for his 1960s 70s contemporaries who did engage in more political concerns or as was the case with Carly Schneeman whose work I hugely recommend you go and look into. He presented to others concerns that they could disagree with and react against, meaning that their important political messages came about. Yet, when he did engage directly with politics in one film, 23rd Sam Branch, which attempts to comment on the mass media coverage of the Vietnam War, he is far too individualised and internalised for the film to be really effective and its goal is really confused. Some thoughts that are also provoked by Mickelson's essay. To just sum up and pose some other questions. It's quite an interesting exercise to watch some brackage and think about notions around the dramatic and narrativity. And do you think they're non-narrative or can you identify a narrative structure of some kind, even if it's abstracted? And what do you think of drama or family drama in his works? It's useful to consider what do you think if you watch some of the work? What would your take on Brackage being a romantic and his move towards abstraction? While in a way moving against the tide of the rest of the avant-garde because they were moving away from abstraction while he went increasingly towards it. This is a really interesting time to bring this up is the idea of considering the defense of the self against the mass because again I think you know I'm making this in the middle of a global pandemic and looking back eight years into my past but also it seems like a very very long time ago because so much has happened in my own life but also globally. I think being at a time in my personal life where I have to learn to be more selfish and move away from the mass. Personally, I'm quite anti brackage I really dislike his work, but I think a lot of the ideas that he was trying to deal with are things that some of them at least I can appreciate. And I think this idea of defending the self against the mass is something I feel more in tune to these days. So maybe it's something that comes with age, although a lot of his sums are super creepy, so there's that too. <laughs> and something I didn't really talk about in this lecture but at the time when I was leading this and any time I've taught Brackage I've got the students to think about his aversion to sound he actively rejects sound in his films his films are generally I think all of them are completely silent there is no soundtrack at all there are some of the films where I find that really problematic so for example Jane giving birth but I think in a way 
that one sense is clear, there are possibilities that arise from that. So I think that's something to consider. I'm going to leave you there and I think again point you towards the Mickelson essay which um, will all of these references or as many of them as I can find will be in the notes below if you want to try and find them and have a look at them. So we're always going to come back to these issues of modernism and questioning the canon. So I hope that was a bit of a, a useful take on looking at Stan Brackage's work. Some more of the themes that are coming up will all start to fall into place as we progress and look at more work by other people. As ever, thank you for watching. If you are able to support this work, please have a look at the links below. If you can give some support at buymeacoffee.com forward slash PEA Blair, I would hugely appreciate that. Also, I make a podcast and if you could search for audiovisual cultures and subscribe to that wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll get more on film analysis but also there are interviews with practitioners and other scholars and things so please do check that out too if you haven't already subscribe to this channel so you don't miss the next video take care and see you next time